God is fighting for us in the land on the words. It felt good, though. Amen. How many know that we serve a God that fights on our behalf? Amen. A God that loves us. That, And you know what I love about Jesus fighting on our behalf is that he don't, he don't fight fair. There's a, there's a scripture in Colossians that says he literally disarms the rulers. Like he literally takes their weapons away from them and then beats them. Uh, and the cross is the greatest place that we see how God can fight on our behalf and make sure that darkness doesn't overtake us. Can we worship Jesus in this room? Those of you who made it to church, can we just thank God for fighting on our behalf? And man, it is so good to worship Jesus in song. The band is just amazing. The worship team leads us so well. There's a scripture that says, worship the Lord with gladness and come before him. Then it says, with joyful song or with singing. And this is the, this is the, the, the place where we can do that. When we get to gather and we get to sing about Jesus. But we also equally are excited about preaching and excited about getting in the word. And that... We, that is what we would say is one of the most important parts of our gathering together. So won't you do me a favor, grab your Bibles or grab your devices. Uh, those of you who are here, go to the New Testament, go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter number 12 is where we're going to be. <clears throat> As you turn there, Gabe already mentioned it, but I just feel ne uh, the need to double down on it. This week is an important week. For you as an individual, corporately for us as a church, we've always tried to take at least the second full week of the year. And since the inception of our church, we started gathering in 2015 and then 2016 was the first time we did our corporate fast together. We get together and we try to shut down and pull away from some things for a week. And really it sets the agenda for the year, but it also models for you what it looks like to have rhythms of prayer and rhythms of fasting. And as you spiritually grow in your faith, those of you who have trusted in Jesus, uh, I don't want to assume everybody has, but those of you who have trusted in the work of Jesus Christ, uh, there should be a maturing year over year over year over year. And I think, you know, sometimes we can trust Jesus and think that our lives and our spiritual growth and our spiritual maturity is supposed to remain the same, but every year it should be uh, you should be growing, and I think fasting helps uh, to connect us to the Lord. Um, Gabe already did it. I'm not going to do it long, but I do want to say, just give a little bit more instruction that 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is typically our fast. So for 12 hours, we ask that you would turn your plate down. Um, use wisdom. Those of you who are on medications or uh, have some type of physical ailment where you, you can't fast for 12 hours, uh, even then I would say be wise. This, this probably isn't the week to go to, go to Clinton Street Bakery, uh, although their pancakes slap. Uh, they, they have the best pancakes in the city. You can get at me about that. Some of y'all are Cafe La Luca. I get it. But it's all about them crispy edges and that fluffy middle. If it ain't crispy on the outside, it ain't a real pancake. Uh, but this is not the week to, to indulge in pancakes. Uh, grab some crackers, grab some toast, uh, take, your, take your vitamins or, or your, your medication, whatever it is that you take uh, in the mornings or the afternoons. And uh, we ask that you would try to shut down, try to pull away from social media. And, you know, I know that's hard for some of you. Some people in here like literally work for Facebook or, <laughs> or work for Instagram. So I, I get it. It's not always easy. But those of you who can pull away from social media, non-work related browsing, this, you know, try to stay away from just scrolling. TikTok, this ain't the week for TikTok and it's so addictive. You can get on TikTok and next thing you know, two hours later, you're still on TikTok. Anybody ever did that? I, I did that a few times where I woke up and I just found myself two hours later still on TikTok. The creativity is out of this world. Um, but we, we really do, you know, we want to connect to the Lord and Monday, this tomorrow, 6 a.m., we will be in this room. For those of you who can make it, uh, the way we've done this uh, historically in our church is those of you who are on your way to the church will just get up earlier. We'll sacrifice some time, and you'll come in. Uh, I'll be right here on my knees praying, 6 a.m. Uh, we start at 6. We are literally done by 7, and then most people jump on the trains and go to work or go back home or whatever it is that you do. Um, but it's something about praying in the morning. You know, David said in Psalm 63, early in the morning will I seek thee. And that's what we come to do corporately. It starts our fast off well. 
Uh, Tuesday, we'll do that prayer uh, Zoom call. That's going to be great. Pastor Timmy's going to lead us in that. Uh, the website will be on the, the website. The link is on the website, and uh, we're going to have it on our social media page, and the email will go out. Wednesday, we'll have prayer and Bible study here, physically here at the church at 7 o'clock. We'll do some praying, and then we'll jump right into to some worship, and then we'll do um, some Bible study. And then Thursday is our virtual meetups, discipleship groups. If you're interested in one, uh, as Gabe said, we do have uh, the availability. Yolanda is here. Please see her today and say, I don't know anybody. I just come to the church and I, I, I'm not connected, but I do want to kind of get into some clusters virtual. I, I, I want to pray with somebody on Thursday. Just connect with Yolanda and we, she plays spiritual matchmaker. She'll be able to connect you with somebody that you'll be able to pray with. And then Friday, uh, Ty and I will be taking over Epiphanies Live. Uh, we originally planned to do a testimony service here, which is like uh, how we like to end our fast. We wanted to have a full buffet of food over there, and we would eat and then have testimony service. Uh, but of course, COVID has has hindered us from being able to do that. But we'll go on live, and I'll bring we'll bring some of you on, and you guys can give us some um, some testimonies of how the Lord's been faithful in 2021. And Maybe share some of your heart for 2022. Is that all right? It's going to be a good week. I'm telling you, it's going to set us. It's going to set us straight. We have scriptures for you. We have prayer guide for you. Uh, it's all on the website right now, and you can check that out uh, so that you can know where we're going. All right, Luke chapter chapter 12. If you're there, if you could just say yeah. All right, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. It says, "Someone in the crowd said to him, meaning Jesus." Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, meaning the crowd, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store all of my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. For God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Someone say rich toward God. I want to preach today from the topic entitled, Giving is Greater Than Greed. Giving is greater than greed. Let's look to the Lord before we dig in. Uh, Father, we thank you this morning. We come to be challenged. We come to be encouraged. We are so grateful that your word is able to do both. You are able to challenge us and you're able to encourage us at the same time. Your word is a double-edged sword. So, Lord, I pray, oh God, as we dig into your word, that you would use this moment, use our time. Holy Ghost, may we have great impact. May hearts be changed today. And may eyes be opened to the beauty and the wonder of Jesus Christ. What one to me if I preach not the gospel? What one to me if I don't talk about Jesus? Would you shut me up if I'm not going to mention his name today? Sit me down and let somebody else talk about Jesus. Because that is who we need. That is who we come to hear from today. So, Father, would you, would you amplify Jesus today in, our, in, in this 930 service? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, yesterday, Ty and I just flew back from Miami. We spent the week in Miami, not the whole week, but most of the week in Miami, we were down there at a, every year we go to this pastor's uh, conference retreat with other pastors from literally, I was going to say all over the country, but it's, it's pastors all over the world that come into Miami, and uh, there, there's different things, different ways that we get fueled up and encouraged, and so while you guys were, were here and shoveling snow, we were in suffering for Jesus in 80 degree weather. I mean, we were suffering. We, we were really suffering. It was, a, it was a lot. 80 degree weather is just, it's hard to bear. Uh, but while we were there, um, you know, it's interesting. Whenever, whenever I travel, I, I'm not the most organized person when I travel. 
And so it's, it's probably because I'm a procrastinator and, you know, I, I pack at the last minute. Anybody else do that? You, I mean, you got a flight in a few hours and you just starting to grab stuff. It's typically how, how I do. And because of that, I often, probably every trip, forget something. And it's so interesting that when you forget something, I usually know it before I even unpack. I'm going, oh, I left my charger. Oh, I left my toothbrush. Oh, I left socks. I've left uh, my, my, my pillow for the plane. I've left headphones. And the beauty of, of, of traveling through airports is most airports, I would say 99% of airports, have some type of convenience store or some type of shopping area, some type of stores that are in that airport. And those stores are there for you to pick up and go. Those stores are not there for you to stock up. Those stores are not there for you to load up. That is why when you travel through an airport, you'll never see a full shopping cart. You never see anybody going, you know what, there's some good discounts at the airport. Let's go to the airport and do some shopping. There are no shopping sprees happening at the airport because everybody in the airport has another destination. Everybody in the airport is just passing through. There's a scripture in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 20 that says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of us in this room are just passing through. This is not your final destination. And the interesting thing is, if you're in the airport and you're shopping and shopping and shopping and shopping, it can actually hinder you or detour you from your final destination. It can stop or it can delay you from getting there. And in a deeper way, in a higher way, I think this is what we get while we're here on earth. And many of us have, we've treated earth like this is it. Like this is the final place. Like this is the place where this, you're only living for now, but we know that there is something greater. There is something eternal, and it is called heaven, and that is what we are waiting for. And I'll say it this way. If you want to know where your allegiance lies, it's important for you to look at your spending habits. Oh, man, it got quiet. If you want to, if you want to know, that there, there's a, I used to say it like this. The, the x-ray of your heart is your bank account. Yeah, you know, some people will say, yo, I got receipts. Like, seriously, receipts will show you what is your God. Receipts will show you if you're living life as a pass buyer or if you're living life and saying, I'm stocking up because this is the place I'm going to be. And uh, I know somebody in here right now is going, oh, here we go. This is why I don't come to church because, you know, the pastor always want to ask. He about to ask me for money. And most people have that disposition, but I actually want to free you up today. I'm going to give you permission not to trust the church today. You don't got to trust the church. It's okay. Like, I'm, I understand. We got to earn your trust. We got to, we got to, you've seen abuse and you, you've seen people take money and still, I get it. I get it. If you don't trust the church, but nevertheless, giving is still greater than greed. I would say you need to give somewhere. You need to be generous somewhere because not, because greediness is a, 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 a dangerous position to have as a heart. Now, it, it greed can, can, can hinder you from so many things. And so, Generosity is always greater. Greed never helps you. Greed never serves you. Greed never serves anybody else around you. My old boss would say it this way, love every idea for the first five minutes. So do me a favor, whether you hate giving or not, would you just love this sermon for the first five minutes? Would you just act like I'm preaching something that's so profound? And today we're talking about how giving is so much greater than greed. And if you have a hard time and you struggle with the idea of a church even talking about giving, I, I just want you to love the idea for the first five minutes. And I want us to all to know that Jesus is talking to all of us. Nobody in this room should look down and be like, this dude in the text, is, he really is a fool. Can I promise you we're not that far off? All of us have some type of greed in our hearts. Y'all rocking with me? Pick me back up real quick in verse, in verse number 15. It says, and he, meaning Jesus, said to them, meaning the crowd, take care, watch these words, and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. There's some words here I want you to pick up. He says, be on guard against what? Covetousness. I think it behooves us to define what covetousness is. It is an insatiable desire for worldly gain. It is the desire to find fulfillment, meaning, and purpose in things and not in God. 
It's the pursuit of material gain. It's the person that always needs and always wants more and always have to have more. And here's what Jesus says today. Be on guard against that. Jesus is basically saying, I I want you to pay attention. I want you to take inventory. Jesus is saying what my boss would say, which is love every idea for the first five minutes. I need you to pay attention to your heart. Now, it's so interesting that Jesus tells us to be on guard against this because it's almost as though Jesus is saying this is an area that can fly under the radar. That This is an area that you might be greedy and not even know that you are. For example, if Jesus, Jesus never has to say be on guard for when you are in the midst of adultery. When you're in adultery, you know you're in adultery. He, hasn't, he never has to say be on guard against stealing. If you stole something, you know it's wrong. He he never has to say, be on guard when you are lying. When you are lying, you know you are wrong. But for some reason, we can be greedy and miss it because for some reason, we we always look at ourselves in the better light. And Jesus says today, I actually want you to be on guard against it. I actually want you to pay attention to it. I actually want you to watch your heart. Why does he say this? Because the pursuit of stuff easily goes undetected. The pursuit of material gain easily goes undetected. But I want all of us to assume that on some level, we have some greediness in our hearts. So many people are going through life and they want more and more and more, Chris. So many people in life never are satisfied with what they have. They want more money. They want more positions. They want more material possessions. There are so many people in life, so many of us in life that are chasing titles and chasing the blue check and we're chasing the bag and we're chasing career moves. And Jesus says, look, I want you to be successful and be all you can be in life, but be on guard against greed. Be on guard. again. Be careful. Pay attention. Watch out for. Take personal inventory. Do me a favor and write this down if you're taking notes. Greed and covetousness is a failure to be content with what God has given you. I don't don't know if that makes sense. Let me say that again. Greed and covetousness is a failure to be content with what God has given you. When you're always chasing the more, see, and that's what we do. We are always lusting after something else. And Jesus is like, but you lack faithfulness over what I've already given you. You, you, You've lacked stewardship over what I've already put on your plate. You, you haven't even been successful and faithful over what you have in your account now, but we're always chasing the more. And please don't hear me make this a sermon as I want every, I don't subscribe to the pro- poverty gospel or the prosperity gospel. I, I'm not saying that everybody in this room should not want to, you know, go up and move up the ladder. I'm, look, look, run after that. But I'm saying, please be careful, be on guard is what Jesus is saying, because there's never enough money to make. You'll never have enough. There's always more money to make. There's always more stocks to invest in. There always is more things to buy. There's always more vacations to go on. There's always more stuff to stock up on. But at some point, you are in the airport with a shopping cart and you don't even know it. You were walking through life and you were, you were holding on to stuff. Here's what Ecclesiastes will say. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Nor will he who loves wealth. If you're always chasing money, you'll never actually have enough and you'll never be satisfied. And here's why I want us to be careful. Here's why I want us to pursue giving and pursue generosity and not pursue greed. Because whenever you're chasing the bag, you're really chasing a ghost. You'll never have enough. I'm going to free you to you'll never have enough. And I don't care how much money you make. You can be a billionaire. Holler at me if you're a billionaire. But you'll never have enough. You'll, you'll always, always want more. And so please don't hear me saying be unwise with your money. Please don't hear me say go outside and just give it all away. God wants you to be a good steward over the resources. First of all, I love the fact that the Bible says that, the, that the, when, he, when he gives the, um, I don't want to jump ahead, but when he gives the parable, it says that the land produced. He's rich because the land produced. He didn't, he didn't go into the ground and make it come up. He didn't make the the, the crops. He didn't call the harvest out of nowhere. No, he was he was subject to God blessing the field. And so his bag really ain't his bag. Let me help you out today. Your bag ain't your bag. And yes, you got the position. Yes, you work hard. I don't want to take none of that away from you. But it's God that gives us the growth. 
It's God that it's God's money in your bank account. And so it behooves us to be good stewards over it. There's a thin line between stewardship and stupidity. It's a real it's a real thin line. And many of us cross that line and we teeter along that line and we don't know what it is. Let me give you uh, some of the breakdown. Stewardship says I'm going to take make, grow, invest money to the, and give money to the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Stupidity says, I'm going to chase money no matter who I hurt, no matter how much I have to save, and no matter what I die with. You notice that this man dies and he says, and your stuff will be left with somebody else. Your stuff's going to be left with another fool. That, that's what he's saying. And, and, and so it behooves us to be on guard. It behooves us to be careful. Look, look at verse 13. He says, teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance. In other words, this man didn't even realize he was the problem. Do you notice that? Verse 13 starts with the man coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, basically, my brother is greedy. Make him give up some of his inheritance and give it to me. And Jesus is like, wait, but you know that you're the fool in the text, right? That that's what Jesus is saying to him. Your brother is not only the problem, and this is why I said all of us have a hint of greed, because all of us can be like this man in the text and go, it's somebody else's issue. Everybody in here knows somebody that's greedy. And it's easier for us to sit and hear this type of a sermon and even write on your notes the person's name because you can always identify somebody that's greedy. But what about us? What about you? What, what about us sitting for a second and absorbing Many of us are like this young man, and we're going, teacher, tell somebody else not to be greedy. Teacher, tell that person not to be greedy. But Jesus is like, nah, you're you're, you're the problem. Because it's always easier to see the issues of somebody else's life and be blind to our own. Do y'all know that's to be true? I read a book. uh, It's it's called Elephant in the Brain. And um, the Elephant in the Brain is an interesting book because it, it talks about how our brain can block out, like if we have major issues in our life, our brain, our brain will block it out. And the reason it blocks it out is because you always want to see yourself in a better light than you really are. And so we'll never deal with our issues, but we're quick to look at somebody else's issues. And that's exactly what this man is doing. He's saying, teacher, look at him. He's greedy. And Jesus turns that thing around. That's what I love about Jesus. Jesus gives parables, right? And you, you know, his parables, sometimes you can be walking home and be like, yo, is that parable about me? <laughs> like, Jesus knows how to light you up in a story, and you don't get it until you get home. And, and I love that about Jesus. And so, really, this whole story is about him, even though he's asking about somebody else. So, I want to urge you this morning to, to allow the word of God to be the mirror, not your personal judgment. I don't care how you personally feel like you're doing in this area. I want you to allow the word to be the personal, to, to be the judgment, not your personal feelings about where you are. And here's what Jesus says. Here's the mirror. Be on guard. Jesus invites you this morning, this morning to pay attention. Life is not found in your job or your bank account or your fresh pair of J's. Life is not found in your car. Life is not found in your house. It's not found at how much money you have in your 401k. Life, the value of life is found in something eternal. Your bank account will not be in heaven. Your money will not be in heaven. Your investments will not be in heaven. Your crypto will not be in heaven. We have to, we have to invest ourselves in something greater. So watch what Jesus does here. Jesus, Jesus tells us in this room today to be on guard, but then he goes on to tell a story. And in the story, he's helping this man see that he's the issue as well, not just his brother. Watch what he says in verse 16. Verse 16, he told them, he says, he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said to him, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, And be merry, but God said to him, watch this, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? Can we agree that if Jesus calls you a fool, you're really a fool? Like if if Jesus calls you a fool, you're a fool on steroids. In fact, I looked up the Greek 
for this word fool, this is going to mess you up. It actually means fool. You, you, if Jesus says you are a fool, there is something you're not quick on the uptake. There is something that you are missing. And so Jesus calls this man a fool. And it's important to know Jesus is not calling him a fool or rebuking him because he's rich. Because a lot of times, see, that's why I said I don't preach a poverty gospel. I believe that some of you, God will bless you with the abundance. But I still would say, be careful of greed. But Jesus isn't rebuking him because He's rich. Jesus is rebuking him because he's stingy. Jesus is rebuking him because he's greedy. Jesus is rebuking him because he's selfish. I did the math for you. 11 times in this parable, this man uses a personal pronoun. Six times he says I. Five times he says my. He's only thinking about himself. Nowhere in this story is he thinking about the poor. Nowhere in this story is he thinking about the needy. Nowhere in this story is he thinking about the broken or the hurt. Nowhere in this story is he thinking about God. He, there's nowhere in this story where he says, you know what? I'm going to store up because I do think it's important for you to make sure that you have security and all that stuff. But I'm going to build another barn, and this barn is going to be God's. And I'm going to put all this, I'm going to put, I'm gonna put the, the tenth or whatever it is that you decide that you want to give to God. I'm going to put that all in here. Nowhere in this story does he do that. He's only thinking about himself. I need bigger barns. For me, and Jesus is like, you ignorant, stupid fool. Okay, he doesn't say ignorant and stupid, but he says, you're a fool. And I'm, I'm just, when, when I read this, I don't want to read the text and look down on this brother as though I'm not in the text. I always want to read stuff like this and be like, Jesus, what would my, how would you respond to me? If you looked at my bank account, which he does, if you looked at my spending, which he does, if you grabbed all the receipts, not from last year, from this year, which he does, he has them all. You might have lost them, but he has every one of them. Would he call me a fool for stocking up? Would he call me a fool for how I spend? And listen, it's God's money. God, God, God blessed you. God gave you money. How foolish we are to take God's money and tear down our small barns and build bigger ones. And it's so interesting in here, you know, when, when you read this text, you, you got to understand that there's so many people that were that have been in this crowd that were financially hurting. Let me let me say it this way. There's so many people in your life that are financially hurting. There are so many things that you can give to that will outlast you like God's kingdom, like the furtherance of mission, like, like, like the furtherance of helping somebody else. There's somebody else around you that needs help. But guess what? We're too busy knocking down and building our own barns. When's the last time you thought about giving to somebody that didn't have? When, when is the last? We just came through a crazy Christmas season. We just came through a hard year. We're coming through COVID-19. We are not done with it, but we're still in the midst of it, but we're going through a hard pandemic and a hard season. When's the last time you looked at somebody and said, I know you lost your job and he's just a little something to help you out. But when, when is the last time we've done that? When's the last time you've given of your time? Forget money for a second. When's the last time have you given of your gifts and the skills that you have? When is the last time you gave? And I don't know, man. I'm just not quick to rebuke this brother today. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm quicker to judge my own heart. And my assumption is we are all similar to the man in the text. You know, Matthew chapter 6 says it this way. Do not lay it. Write that down. Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. Why? Here's why. Where moth and rust destroy. And thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. And wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be. Jesus is like, look, don't stock up here because the stuff that you're stocking up will rust and destroy. Everything that you have right now that's of material possession has depreciated since you came in. Everything. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't owe my house didn't de depreciate. You give it some more time. Let's check the stock market. Let's check the political climate. Like every, there's so many things. You are at the whim of so many other things. But Jesus is like, look, man, don't, don't stock up here. Rust and moth destroy it. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And then he goes on to say, because there is no moth there. Rust can't destroy that type of a treasure. That eternal, have, that eternal happiness is so much greater than the temporary happiness that we get when we spend. And honestly, we're spending and going in debt to impress people that really, we really don't like them anyway. 
we, we stocking up to, to impress people that don't like us either anyway, but we want to have a moment where we floss. And the reality is Jesus is like fool. What I found that is that covetousness and greed is not easily just removed from the heart. Please don't miss this. This is, this is probably the most important part. Greed and covetousness is not easily removed from the heart. You actually have to replace it. You can't just remove greed out of your heart. You got to replace it with something greater than greed. You got to replace it with something better than greed. What better place to, or better person to replace greed with than Jesus? Because what Jesus does is Jesus models for us what it looks like to be generous. Jesus models for us what it looks like to be sacrificial. Jesus models for us what it looks like to give. This is why your favorite scripture is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, he was generous. He gave Jesus models for us. When I said giving is greater than greed, it's not because I like giving. Giving is greater than greed because Jesus gave. Do you understand? I don't give because I want to get. I give because Jesus gave everything to me. And because Jesus gave everything to me, now I have a model. I can't just remove greed. I have to replace it with the generosity of Jesus Christ. Let me put scripture here. here. Here's what the Bible will say about Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for our sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, you might become rich. Did you hear that? That Jesus was spiritually rich, but for your sake, he became poor. So that by his poverty, you might become spiritually rich. I, I'm, I'm just telling you the, the reason why I worship Jesus because Jesus took his barns and tore them down. And says, I'm going to tear them down because this is what's going to give you full access to heaven. This is what's going to give you full access to a holy God. There is no other way for us to be in the presence of a holy God. But Jesus says, I got one way. I'm going to take my riches and I'm going to make myself poor. So that I can give you that richness life that by your by his poverty, we might become rich. And many of us are still stuck in a parable. Eleven times he uses this personal phrase. I wonder how many of us are going through life and we're just thinking of ourselves and we're only thinking of us. Speaking of modeling generosity, we're going to model it today. Our, our hospitality team is coming around. And they're, they have a basket. And in the basket right now, I know some of y'all are going, oh, here we go. There it is. I knew he was going to do it. He's going to pass that thing around, and we got to put money in it. But today, I actually want to do the opposite. I don't want you to model generosity. The church is modeling generosity for you today. So as the basket comes around, normally we're saying put something in it. Don't put anything in it. I actually want you to take something out of it. Inside of the, inside of the baskets is an envelope, and the envelope says, Greed versus giving. Inside that envelope is money. Now, here's what I want you to do. It's literally yours. Put it in your purse. Take it home. And you can do one or two things this week. You can buy yourself, well, we fast in following week. You can buy yourself lunch or you can keep this spirit of generosity going and look for somebody else and say, I got something for you and slip them a little envelope. Look around your life. You know how many family members you have that are in need right now? Do you know how many uncles are in need right now? Do you know how many co-workers are in need right now? Do you know how many people you pass on the street or on the train that are in need right now? This week, instead of putting in that plate, I actually wanted you to take out. Because I want you to either, and I promise you, no judgment. If you take that thing open it up, and go down the street and buy you a number seven with cheese, I ain't mad. We won't judge you. But I wonder what it would look like for us to start this rhythm of generosity. I wonder what it would look like for us to start giving. Please don't come back to the next service and take another envelope. <laughs> I know the spirit in the room. <laughs> Worship team, don't get another envelope. <laughs> Josh, don't be getting another envelope. But I, I do. This is yours. All, no, this is yours. Take it with you. And I really, I want to know this week what you'll do with it. 
And we won't know. We ain't reporting back. I ain't asking you, yo, give me an inventory. We ain't including no spreadsheet with this and saying, here's what the money went and how we did it. That's typically how we do this. I asked Gabe to pull this out because I literally wanted to give it to you. And whatever you decide to do with it, do it. But here's my question to you. I love the way verse 21 says it. He says, are we rich toward God? Did, did, did you read that? We didn't, we, we didn't get to it, but did you read rich toward those people who are rich toward God are people that understand I'm not going to go through life and only think about me. I'm actually going to go through life and I'm going to think about somebody else. That's being rich toward God. Rich toward God is the person that's not sitting in the airport with a shopping cart are not going through life and stocking up and stocking up and stocking up. And, but the person that says, now nah, I got to give something away. Do you know, I, I didn't know I was going to go here, but a church called me, play something soft, Josh. A church called me in December at the end of the year, and the church said, hey, listen, we got a surplus. We looked at our budget, and we, we had, a, we had a, a, a proposed amount that we were trying to hit at the end of the year, and we hit, the, we hit that number, and we got a surplus, and so we're just giving the rest of it away. How much you need? Do you, do you understand? And see, oftentimes when we preach about generosity, we always attach it to, I'm giving because I'm a get. Your season cometh and you're going to get a tenfold blessing. How about the blessing is in the giving? The blessing isn't in the getting. That's why the Bible says it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Somebody today, I know... This is a quick one today, but I know what your heart is saying. I know many of us are going, ah, it's just not me, though. I'm a generous person. Could we be more generous? Could we be more giving? Could we be more loving? Because here's what I know. God didn't save you, put money in your account for you to live life by your terms. He saved us, put money into our account so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. And by and large, Epiphany Church is a generous church. I've said this before. We ask you guys to give. We are in this building right now because you modeled giving over generosity. I mean, over greed. So I, I'm not beating you up, but I know we could do better. Not giving here, just being generous people. I know we can do better. And so this week, that's what I want you to do. Contemplate giving, being greater than greed. Father, I thank you for everybody that's in this room. Father, I imagine that in this story, there's probably the elite and the, and the affluent are probably all shook right now. Because you pulled down the positions of power in this moment. I need everybody low is what you say. You're saying, I need you generous. Fool is what you called him. And so, Father, we've gone through life and many of us, we've been foolish We've built bigger barns and not built your kingdom. We've built our brand and not built your kingdom. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, today, I, I thank you for every person that has moved up and got the positions that they wanted. And some, that's not everybody in the room, but I, Father, I'm grateful. But, Father, help us to realize that our money it is, isn't ours. Our gold isn't ours. The stuff we have in our, in our refrigerators and on our backs right now isn't ours. Everything comes from you. And so, Father, I pray, oh God, that you would mark this year as a year that we are way more giving than we are greedy. That you would help us to move from being the man in this story to looking more like you. You gave everything to us. You didn't hold back anything. You didn't ask us to pay a portion of the bill of the wrath of God. You paid it all for us. Modeling generosity. Modeling what it looks like to be sacrificial. And so, Father, would you help us to walk out and be the same way as we engage in this dying world and engage with people that are in need? Help us to be the answer to somebody's prayer. Help us to look around and say, Father, I how can I bless somebody? Who, who is it? Help us to be like that church calling around saying, I got a surplus and I just want to give it away. Father, would you do that? And I just believe, oh God, that that will make us a healthier church. If we're all looking for ways that we could be generous and make impact in this neighborhood. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.